one hour and 43 minutes after they blasted off from the Merritt Island launch complex in Florida, the crew of Apollo 13 climbed out of their command module. It was to have taken them to the moon, took them instead around the moon with the help of the lunar module Aquarius and back to Earth, no help from the service propulsion system, which was blown out by that explosion on Monday night. The drama that began at 10.08 p.m. that night has been brought to a successful curtain. By the way, this is one thing I'm positive these three men didn't do is practice this procedure together. <laughs> oh, great. That's good old really close picture. Good old 66 there again. Yeah. <laughs> Fred A's, 36, Biloxi, Mississippi. Graduate of junior college there and the University of Oklahoma, where he got a degree later after having his flight training in the Navy. Hayes' first flight, as it was Jack Swigert's. Space rookies was the fourth, and as he announced before he made this flight, the last for the I'd say they're all space veterans after this mission. <laughs> what a mission, hmm? Ooh. That ride must be sort of fun, isn't it? Feels kind of a uh, you're uh, you know, off to practice that one. It still seems somewhat different than the last. I always consider this the riskiest part. Jack Swiker. 38 years old, Denver, Colorado. The man who was not scheduled to make this trip. So Ken Mattingly, who's in mission control, we've seen just a little while ago in pictures there. Ken Mattingly, the scheduled command module pilot, uh, was susceptible to German measles and exposed to them, so they put Swigert on the flight at the last minute. I'd like to make note of something here, too. Uh, you have to realize they did a real good job of coming back in. Now, Jack was trained to do this, and he's the one that flew it in, so it just shows that we can 
interchange crewmen, uh, at least at this type of crewmen, the command module pilot, would expect some success, which we saw. It's quite, a, quite encouraging. I've been kidded in the past, Walter, on this. Uh, when you uh, give up your command, this is what we call a deep draft command as a Navy captain. <laughs> uh, for a while, I was called deep draft Shira by my support crew. <laughs> this Why deep draft? Well, when you're a Navy captain to qualify for command of a large ship at sea, uh, you're typically assigned in a, uh, to a support ship that has a deep draft. Uh, so we try to qualify by having a flight such as this. And there goes Jim Lovell. 42 old Navy Captain. Veteran of four flights and almost one full month in space. And they're all three up aboard. Say they're feeling fine on the helicopter. We've heard that uh, Mrs. Hayes is jubilant and thankful as might certainly be expected. She spoke with President Nixon just moments ago and told him that this is the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. It certainly must have looked that way to Mary Hayes. This is her husband's first flight in space. She has three small children there at home with her and is expecting another in a couple of months. She watched the splashdown with her children in the bedroom of her home there with her sister, Mrs. Dunkel, and astronaut Jerry Carr and Alan Bean were there, and the Reverend Mrs. John uh, Fellows of uh, Clear Lake Methodist Church. All there with her. It's critical last minutes. Marilyn Lovell and her four children have been all through all this before, of course, three times before, but this was the roughest one yet. Out in Denver, Colorado, Dr. and Mrs. Swikert, the parents of Bachelor Jack Swikert, hadn't been through it before and hadn't expected to go through it this time and certainly hadn't expected this sort of mission out of it. But we'll be back with more coverage of the recovery of Odyssey in a moment. The laser beam. It was still just a gleam in the eyes of scientists until 1965, when engineers at Bell Labs and Western Electric became the first to put the laser on the job in industry. The job, piercing holes in industrial diamonds to make thin telephone wire. Today, Western Electric uses the laser to cut material for thin film electronic circuits. We also use the laser to measure and to weld tiny parts for equipment we make for the Bell Telephone Network. Someday, the laser beam may transmit telephone calls and other data. Someday, you may find yourself talking over one. Western Electric. We make Bell Telephones. We were also the first to put the laser beam on the job in industry. There is the recovery helicopter 66, famed old 66, has done this job before and now has a very precious cargo aboard indeed. Three men who three or four days ago, uh, well, the odds weren't uh, too high perhaps that they'd be making this flight today, but they made it. Uh, thanks to thousands of people on the ground in Houston and at uh, various other space centers around the country who spent the time in simulators and on computers and with their slide rules to uh, figure out just how to get them back after the near catastrophe 205,000 miles out there from Earth when something exploded in the service module and denied them the power that normally they would use to get around the moon and back home. They uh, say nothing of the, their own skill of these three astronauts in carrying out their orders and helping figure out what had to be done and doing it calmly, dispassionately as test pilots are trained to do to get that command module back. Well, it got back. It landed uh, at 108, just where it was supposed to, just on time. The last uh, 
14 minutes of that flight uh, were just as it was scheduled to be. Up to that time, emergency procedures since 10.08 Monday night. It had been a long, long experience uh, getting them to that position where they finally let loose the lunar module Aquarius that had given them life support and power to come back to Earth. Aquarius and the service module, and as far as we know, splashed down where they were supposed to, about 500 miles uprange, 500 miles from this site, uh, just before the command module itself got in.